<clears throat> Thank you, Phil. All right. Got it. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm John and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, it's so great to be here, you know. Wow, how amazing. Um, uh, I was thinking how nice it would be to, uh, yeah, I'm a musician. I was thinking how nice it would be to be playing in Tennessee tonight, but that's not to be, but this is absolutely the next best thing um, to be speaking at a meeting around Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, I've just, I just checked my uh, clock and um, I've got time. This is my 28th year. So my last, last sober birthday in November was 27. So that's, so what you're going to hear is what, you know, that's that the view from 27 years. Um, uh, so let's start at the beginning. I was born in uh, 1960. Um, I was born on this. How do you guys reverse it? Six of the 20th, six twenty sixty is my birth date, and uh, I was born in the Midlands of England. I always loved that birth date, by the way. I, that was one thing I never wanted to change about myself. One of the few things was my birth date. I, I always loved the symmetry of that. Um, I'm an only child. I was born to two really lovely, lovely uh, people that um, were definitely not perfect, but they were, but they were good, good-hearted, good-hearted people. And um, I was, um, I was their only child. I actually think I, it, I may have been the result of the only time that they had sex, as a matter of fact. But, but I'm not. I, I can't confirm that. But I just like. Given what I saw, you know, later on, I thought, you know what, these guys, they just did it the ones. Um, but, um, you know, my um, my father was, uh, he'd been a POW, he'd been a prisoner of war during the Second World War. And, um, and uh, you know, and, and, and that was really the most, you know, that was that was the thing that went with him everywhere. It was the, I called it the, the khaki elephant in the living room. It was this thing that was just always there, ever present, the experience that he'd had, but I wasn't allowed to talk to him about it and blah de blah de blah. My dad, I think, was was a very thirsty man as it happened, and he was repressing his desire to drink all the time. And uh, you know, my mom really didn't like him drinking. My mother was a Catholic. She was like a Catholic first and foremost. She was like a Catholic first, a human being second, you know, and, and she found through through the church, that that was where she had her friends. That they everybody there spoke her language, and um, you know she was a she was a sweet she was a sweet sweet gal. Um, and uh, but you know she married my dad. They moved out to the sticks. She didn't drive, and she was kind of stranded. And so she was she was kind of lonely, you know. And she was lonely as she and she, as she had me, and so. You know, we had a very we had a very close relationship, and and um, you know, every, as I, as I was a little a little kid before I went to school, I uh, you know every day the two of us would walk for miles to go to the church, you know, and, and we'd do that thing, and and um, my mom didn't like my dad drinking at all. I mean, the first, I mean, you know, my first vision of alcohol was you know we had a drinks cabinet, you know, in the front room, you know, the best room. That was the room that we really only went into you know, for like a special meal on a Sunday and like holidays, like Christmas, like otherwise that room was locked tight, you know, had all the heirlooms in it, you know, not that, you know, um, whatever passed for an heirloom, but it had this, it had this drinks cabinet and, and, and I would open this drinks cabinet, you know, even when I was a little toddler and I'd see these, I'd see these kind of these green bottles, you know, Cinzana, Rosso, Martini, Gordon's Gin, you know, Bell's Whiskey, all these brand names and, and these smell and sticky tops and, and all this and this, this stuff, you know, and it was, and it was kind of mystical, you know, in a way, you know, because this stuff would really only come out very, very rarely. As I, as I, as I got older, but still kind of like a, a, a child, I started to associate, you know, these bottles with, kind of magical times you know when people came to visit when the priest came to visit or when my nan came or when you know when relatives came and to celebrate their their presence in our house the cabinet would be open and one of these bottles would be taken out and it would and this smell I mean the smell of gin when I think about it, I still quite like the smell of gin actually it's got this you know really extraordinary sort of flavor to it and whiskey and all, all, all these different things but then you know it would go back and it was almost like 
I mean, it was like magic, you know. And um, and I remember, you know, I, like I was probably six, five, six, seven when I I got in there with a glass and I mixed a few things up and and you know thought I'd try it and like that was one of the first really big mistakes of my life, and that was probably one of the first times, you know, I mean, I just you know I felt so ill and felt so bad, so. You know, I didn't know what that was. I just knew it wasn't for me. So I stayed away from that for a while. And I think the first time that I kind of met alcohol on its own terms and, you know, was, was again, you know, family tradition. Sundays we would have this, we would call it a roast in, uh, and, and, and it would be like lamb, beef or chicken, ding, 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 week by week, you know, and we'd have this meal. And it was really the only time that my parents and I would actually sit and have this meal together. And my dad would mix this, this beer. He would, he would use this brown ale, really sudsy, dark brown beer, and he would mix it with lemonade. And he, we called it a shandy in the UK, right? And he would mix this and he would give me one, right? And maybe I was 10 at this time, 10, 11, 12. And we'd like chink glasses and I'd have like, you know, he'd have a bigger one and I'd have a little one. And, and that felt good. It felt like, ah, you know, my but dad's recognizing that I'm like, I'm a man, you know? And it felt like there was something about it. I mean, it didn't, I, I'm not saying it, it had a, that, that had like had an extraordinary effect on me, but it was like a rite of passage thing, you know? I, uh, you know, I, I, only children, I don't know if there's any only children in the, in the audience <laughs> on this call, but, you know, I didn't love school, to be honest. I didn't, I didn't love it, you know? I came from a home where I, I never had to fight for attention. You know, nobody criticized me if I got the answer wrong. You know, it was like a lot of love. And, um, and, and, and school was competitive, man, you know. And I, and, I, and I realized that, like, you know, if you came to school and you, already, you came from a home where you were already, like, vibing with your siblings and there was a certain degree of competitiveness, then you were a little bit more primed for someone like me who was just used to having it all my own way. You know, and I, and I get to school and it's like, and it's not all about me. And I, I, I realize I'm kind of shy and, and, you know, and as, as I got older, um, you know, I mean, I wasn't athletic. I wasn't into, I wasn't into any of that. And I, 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 I was kind of too shy to shine. Um, and, um, you know, as I got, as I got into my teens, I just sort of, just sort of pulled away from school. You guys call it playing hooky. I started playing hooky a lot, like day after day after day. And, and what filled that vacuum was this like burgeoning love for music that I had. I just, I just started getting into music. I started getting into the, the music stars of the day. There was like Bowie and Queen and Rod Stewart, you know, and, 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 and the Beatles obviously. But I, start, I, I really start getting into music and I start spending most of my days like up in the town, hanging around the record stores, having a coffee, you know, having a piece of cake and then going back home, you know, and my parents think, oh, he's been at school all day. And I would do that over and over again. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I went to college for a year and, and when I was at college, I formed a band and, you know, I was quite, I was quite lucky, um, you know, again, because of when I was born, like in the mid seventies in, uh, in the UK, um, there was this, there was this musical movement called punk rock and it's really if you weren't there it's really hard to I mean it was it was so huge this thing was it was huge for about a year and for about a year like every kid my age like 15 16 17 year old suddenly everybody wants to be in a band you know and um and you didn't have to play you didn't really have to be able to play that much you know I had no musical training but I just knew I loved music and and and, and I'd been going to see these artists you know on these big stages thinking, wow, you know, I'll never do that, you know. And, and, and suddenly there's this like street movement, you know, and it's all about, it's just about attitude and what you're wearing and how you're doing your hair and you really don't need to play that much. And I'm like, well, I don't need to play that much. And I just start playing with some of my mates from school. And I just, I found my, I found my need. I mean, we talk here about, we found our tribe and definitely I found my tribe here. But when I was 16, and suddenly finding like kids that were just happy to make music out of like fucking tins, biscuit tins, you know, and one drum, you know, and like, I mean, it was basic shit, man. But, you know, we had, it was great, great fun and started writing songs and 
and they were terrible but we just kept at it and it was terrible but we just loved it and it was terrible but you just you just kept doing it and, and you know a little bit the way I feel about AA actually I mean I generally when I do when I when I do something in music and I've been doing it a long time now whether it's a song or a show I'll think yeah 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 it was good next time it's going to be better though you know because I think it's just it's just something that you're always always working towards some kind of you know you like we talk about progress not perfection you know the chances you're not going to hit perfection you know you're just not but you know what you just keep making progress and um and I got a record deal when I was really young. My band, we scored a, we scored a, we scored a deal. And um, suddenly I'm like, you know, I'm still living at my parents' house and I'm going around the world and I'm starting to tour. And, and this is where drugs and alcohol enter, really enter into my story because, you know, I'm essentially this like pretty shy kid and uh, pretty low key. Uh, I've, got this, I've got this accent. You, if I spoke in the accent that I had back then, nobody would understand the word I was saying. You know, I was I was like this suburban kid from the Midlands of England, and um, and I have to meet this moment in my life where suddenly, you know, we're on TV, we're on girls' walls, we're like fucking everywhere, and and somebody introduces me to cocaine, and the cocaine and alcohol's already in there, but alcohol's just in there because, like, well, you know, you I'm like nineteen and twenty and people are drinking now. I mean, we, we're all drinking when we're 19, right? I mean, like, that's what you do. It's part of, it's part, it's one of the, it's one of the things that makes a, a difference between a grown up and a kid, right? We drink, you know, a few times a week. And, um, and uh, somebody puts this fucking, gives me a line of cocaine and suddenly the, the, what I've been drinking, it's like push turbo power and whatever it was I was drinking. And I like to think, I, I was like, you know, this is like 1981, right? So, Rum and Coke, Planters Punch, if anybody remembers that, screwdrivers, those kinds of things, really cheap champagne, actually not always cheap champagne, white wines, German white wines, those kinds of drinks, which you add a little toot to that. And suddenly, why well, I tell you, I am like the man, right? And, you know, I've got a gig, you know, where really I go to work at nine o'clock at night, right? And I've got to like preserve this energy. I've got to, I've got to maintain my energy. And then nine o'clock, out the traps, two hours of like hell for leather, full on energy. And then I come off and then I want to have fun, right? Well, you know, really my body wants to go to bed. My body wants to say, uh, John, can we, can we call it a night now? And I'm like, hell no, <laughs> the, 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 the night is just starting, you know? And I realized that this, this cocaine and, and, and alcohol combo was just what I needed to really, to really put a light a fire under 11 p.m., you know? And turn 11 p.m. rather than like the, the witching hour, the hour that everybody's going to bed into that time of day where really, really the day gets started. And, and I have to say, you know, for about, well, no more than two years, but less than two years, but it fucking worked. And, you know, it's something, there's some things that we all stand together on, every one of us and on every one of us in this meeting tonight, I think, you know, there was a moment for us all when it worked you know if it hadn't worked we wouldn't have gone on doing it for years and years and years i couldn't believe how well it worked i couldn't believe how much fun i had under the influence of drugs and alcohol it was insane and i would say for about 18 months forget work i mean work just went out the window but the time i had was incredible and until it wasn't and and I suppose, you know, we often talk in AA, don't we, about like when we start drinking, when drinking uh, really takes over, we almost, our gro we, we pause, you know, we, we stop growing, you know, because, because really all we're doing is drinking and using, you know, and everything else, you know, and, 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 and you know, and I, you know, and my band, the fact that I was in this band, you know, it's such a big part of my story. And the fact that you've got like this only child that essentially forms this partnership with these these four guys who were all the same age we all come from the same socioeconomic background you know our parents got along really well we all had the same sense of humor and we we're all moving through this career together and really pretty kind of extraordinary um to ride that we all took together but i noticed after a couple of years that a couple of them have gotten married and and, and, and bought homes and you know they've gotten a couple of them got, got a dog 
one of them got a cat and, a, and they're paying the bills and me, I'm just waking up thinking, have I got what I need for tonight? Have I got what I need for tonight? And, you know, my, my, because my, because the, the drugs and the alcohol have become my primary purpose, you know, and, and, and what went from, you know, when I was 21, it was like this luxury. It was a luxury. I mean, the first time I came to America and some fucking record company guy rolled up a hundred dollar bill and said, here, toot the line off that. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is success, you know? Um, but, and I got frozen that, that was suddenly like the most, that was like, that was the most, you know? And, but, but my other guys were like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. But I mean, like, there's more to life than that, you know? Well, not for me, there wasn't, you know, that I got stuck on that, you know, I got stuck on that and, it, and everybody else is just getting on, you know, they're just getting on, they're just progressing life on life's terms. I mean, I mean, life on life's terms is a phrase that we get introduced to in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, like that's the kind of people we are. That idea has to be introduced to us because we have never done life on life's terms. You know, we've always, always, always looked for a side hustle, looked for a shortcut, looked for something, 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 some way, some manipulation. So we don't have to do life on life's terms. I don't want to do life on life's terms. And when I, and when somebody gave me this alcohol drug combination, that was it. I was done with life. I just wanted to be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. You know, if I was awake, that's how I wanted it to be. Well, you know, like for, like all of us here, it worked until it stopped working. And, and, you know, and people were starting to talk about me behind my back and, you know, and, and the hangovers were getting, you know, were getting heavy and I was having to cancel a lot of work and you know that's the other thing we get super good at manipulating i mean if you've got a dependency on anything you know you're going to become a manipulator you know because because start stage one you realize you've got a dependency here you've got a habit you've got an addiction even though i wouldn't have used those words at the time but then you realize too you cannot let anybody know so what do we do? We've got to start lying through our teeth. No, I'm, I can't come into work today. I've got, this, I've got this pain or I've got this, or, you know, granny just came into town or whatever it was, you know, we'd have to start telling these, ex making these excuses, telling these lies. And we start getting, we start getting away with all of this stuff. I mean, I guess I got to about 25, 26 and I started thinking, you know what, maybe I need to, uh, maybe I need to look at this, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, you know, the kind of the career was sort of going off, you know, we kind of lost our, the honeymoon was over. We weren't, we weren't really the, the hot, the hot thing anymore. And I started thinking, maybe I need to look at my, my drinking and using, you know, maybe I need to, you know, and, um, you know, and I thought, well, I'll just, you know, maybe I'll just do it at the weekends. You know, it probably started that, that period. And again, we've all had that period, right? We've all gone through that period. You don't get to AA without having a phase in your drinking where you think maybe I'll just do it at the weekends, you know? And, um, and that seems like a good plan until you get to Thursday. Yeah. And then you get to Thursday and somebody offers you a drink and you go, well, actually I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to, well, do you want a line? Yes, I'll have that, you know, or whatever it is. And, and, and I'm not terribly good with boundaries today, to be honest, <laughs> you know, in fact, it's, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like if I want to do something, don't, I, I have to tell myself, don't set yourself a boundary because I'm just, just terrible at that. And every time I try to, I try to rein in my using, using some kind of, you know, look, just, just drink, just have a beer. If you go out, just have a beer and I have a beer, but then the beer would set, I didn't know it at the time, but it would just start this thing going and I needed something stronger. And I'd have a fucking double vodka and then the fucking vodka got something going and then I'd need some drugs and then, and then who knows? And then thank God I'm still alive because, you know, drugs and alcohol started to get me into a lot, take me to a lot of dark places, you know? And, um, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I tried some really um, desperate measures to get sober. I got married, you know, I thought that that'll calm me down. It didn't, I thought, and then we had a child. I thought that would calm me down. It didn't, 
we moved to California. It didn't, nothing worked, nothing worked. And what's more, all of those big life changes that would affect any normal person just made me more and more made me think I have got a fucking problem and I don't know how to do anything about this. Now, I don't know whether I would have said the problem was my drinking and using. I think at this, at this point now, I'm just thinking I am a loser, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, I don't know, you know, Monty Python's Flying Circus. I don't know whether we have anybody in the room that remembers Monty Python's Flying Circus. Yeah, they had a character called Dumby and he would go, what is wrong with me? What is wrong? And I was like that guy. I was like banging my head against the wall going, what's the matter with me? Why can't I get on, what's, you know, why can't I get on top of this thing? And, um, and, 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 and I was like, everything else was going wrong in life. You know, my marriage was falling apart, you know. And so I start seeing a therapist and um, seeing a therapist, I've moved to LA. I'm seeing a therapist there and uh, seeing her several times a week. And we're talking and talking and talking and talking about, about the marriage and why the marriage isn't this and isn't that. And uh, I've got to go back to, um, got to go back to London to work. And I'm, I'm really nervous. I have to say I'm nervous because I know that I, you know, I'm like, a, I've got no control, you know, and I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to get on the plane and somebody's going to offer me a drink and then blah, blah. I mean, who knows what can happen? And, and I'm kind of terrified. And I said to the therapist, I said, you need to find me somebody I can see when I go, you know, you need to find me somebody that I can, I can speak to when I get there. I mean, that's how fragile my life was at that point. And, you know, and I'm lucky. And as I say that to you guys, you know, I realized I was privileged, you know, and I, I, I was privileged that I was actually able to say that to somebody and I was able to get off the airplane at the other end and go and see somebody you know but I talked to this person for 10-15 minutes and this guy said to me look I'm not the guy for you but there is a woman you might want to talk to she works out of the uh, healing center in St John's Wood her name is XXY why don't you give her a call and I called this lady and she was an American lady Lois Evans she said to me well look can you be here at seven o'clock and I said yeah and I went to see her this is still the day I've gotten off the plane I, I, you know, and I spoke to her for about 20 minutes and she said, you need to get into three 12 step programs right now. She says, you need to get sober. If you get sober, you could really be somebody. And if you get sober, maybe we can find out what it is that's, that's going on with you. And I mean, that was the first time I'd heard those words, three step, 12 step programs. I think getting sober is probably the first time I'd heard that idea, you know, and, um, she suggested I go to rehab in America. This is where the best ones are. And um, so I, uh, I didn't do it right away. Actually, I have to say, I didn't do it right away. I needed to have, I just needed to have one more night, you know, one more just great night where I went out with no intention of drinking, but I did have one drink. And, you know, and I ended up coming home at about 11 a.m., you know, with shit on my pants, no money in my pocket, you know, of just a fucking mess, you know, like what the hell happened? Well, you know, that's how I, that's how we like them in AA. That's how we like our newcomers. And I was plumped up and ready. And so I surrendered, you know, I surrendered and I went to Arizona and I signed up for 30 days at Sierra Tucson. And I've got to say, again, I feel immensely privileged that I got to make that choice, you know, that I was able to, you know, that I was able, that I was able to make that choice, you know. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, this is my story, you know, and uh, day one, uh, I'm still, I'm still wearing the scrubs because I'm detoxing, but I go to my first AA meeting, my first 12 step meeting, and it's a round robin meeting. And there was about 30 clients, I think they called them or patients in the rehab. And the guy that was leading the meeting that day, it was his last day. He was about to leave the next day and he was feeling pretty good about himself. He said, I'd like to hear about gratitude. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you know what's what's gratitude and uh, people start to share and I'm like well wait a minute that's that's how I feel and that's that's my experience and you know and I'm I'm having identification right what we call identification and and as the shares roll around I'm thinking wait a minute wait a minute you know what's going on here 
you know i i i i was convinced that my problems were unique you know that i was unique that really there really could not be any kind of you know group antidote you know for what i had because my story was so unique but i'm hearing people are using language to describe how it has been for me what it was like you know what it's like now and um and you know and in that identification that wall is broken down you know that that wall is broken down you know and and i'm and my eyes are you know watering you know and and i'm softening and i'm and you know is that you know optimism is that like a sense of you know something is that faith you know that's kind of like a appearing in in my mind do i you know i remember i remember in that very first meeting somebody said we've been hauled out of the drink and we've been put in the lifeboat and this is a lifeboat and i'm like wow wow i get that i get that i get that i get that and <clears throat> You know, and I had another, you know, and I had a 30 day introduction to the 12 steps, steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I mean, it was it was fucking radical. I mean, it was it was extraordinary. And, you know, I mean, I love this program. I love everything about it, you know, and I love how it's all about me, but it's all about us, you know, and I can. And, and if I want to make it all about me, I damn well can. But you know what? It's so much better when I make it all about us. And it's so much better when you and me get together and talk about how it's all about me or you, you know, and it's just that, I don't know. It's just, it's just this language that we use. And it's just, if you got it, 12 steps speaks to you, you know, if you got it. And, you know, and I came out of that rehab on day 31 at one and I went back to Los Angeles. I went to my first open meeting of AA and it was at the log cabin. You know, if anybody's been to LA sober, they may well have been to the log cabin. I mean, it's just a classic, you know, it's just one of the great rooms. Thousands of people have gotten sober in that room. And I and I go to this place at 7.30 a.m. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> the energy, the energy in that in that room. I mean, the energy of like, you know, a hundred sober men and women, you know, that are many of whom are camping days. I thought, oh, I never need to go to a nightclub again. This is what I've been looking for my entire life. And I meet this guy. I meet this, I, I, I was sort of on a blind date actually that my wife had set up with this, this other English musician that like was one of, one of the great punk rockers as it happens. And, and I'm like, what? He's alive. Hey, no, he's not just alive. He's sober and he's got time and he will meet you at this meeting. And so I go and I meet him and like, you know, people are like giving it, people are like, hey man, shaking hands, you know, there's respect and this guy's got integrity. And, you know, day 31, you know, we go to, I think we went to three meetings that day. You know, we went to this big old early morning meeting and we went to a noon or somewhere. And then we went to a men's meeting, stag meeting in the evening. I mean, that was fucking terrifying. I mean, I couldn't remember the last time. I mean, I mean, who wants to who wants to be a, a, in a room alone in a room with 30 guys? Not me. <laughs> and not then I didn't. You know, now I love it. You know, but then I was just terrified. But, you know, <clears throat> I made it to bed that night. You know, I made it to bed that night. And um, the following morning, you know, I woke up like there was a fire in the house. I get in the car, I drive to the fucking log cabin at 7.30 in the morning. I make it through the, I make it into the meeting. Oh my God, you know, I mean, it is. I mean, those early days, guys, it's like hand to mouth. You know, I, I tell people that accounting days, you just, all you've got, to, all you need to care about is meetings, meetings, meetings. You know, you want to do, you need to do three meetings in a day, do three meetings in a day. There ain't no shame in it. All that matters if you, if you, is that you get through the day sober, you know? All, you, all that matters is that time, time. People say time don't matter. Of course it matters because you're building character and you're building resilience. You're building resistance because damn, that drink is gonna come at you. That, those drugs are gonna come at you and you need to be, you don't need armor. We need, we need to be armored. It is a shit show out there. I mean, there's more drink Drugs, 
alcohol out there today than ever in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? So if we are going to live a life, you know, outside of Zoom, outside of our own homes, outside of meetings, man, we've got to be tough. We've got to be tough. We've got to be strong. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I love meetings. That is not what I just said. Not a problem for me. I love them. I've never, I've never left a meeting and thought that was a waste of time. I never have. I swear. I've never thought it was a waste of time. I call it money in the bank. Like, I'm, on the other hand, I'm the worst person. I've never saved a dime in my life. Give, give me a dollar, I spend it. I'm one of those guys. You know, I'm like, earn a dollar, spend two. I've never been good at saving money. But meetings, money in the bank, money in the bank. And, um, you know, the English dude, the punk rocker, you know, he's taking me around. He's taking me every day, every day, this guy. I mean, every fucking day he is driving me around town and we're going to meetings. I mean, you know, and, um, you know, and after a few weeks, I asked him to be my sponsor. And he's, well, I, I actually, I already am. And, uh, and um, you know, and, and we were, you know, we go through the steps. I mean, I mean, the sponsor sponsor relationship. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, it's it's one of the many gifts in this program. I'm not sure that there's any gifts that are greater than that. The sponsor sponsor relationship. I mean, as a guy that really struggled to be a man amongst men and really struggled to be a guy a, like like a guy's guy, you know, um, never really liked soccer, never really like, you know, the kind of those obvious bonding things that guys have. Um, I found it, I found with my, my sponsor taught me all about that. You know, he has taught me how to be a man amongst men. And, um, you know, and he's completely the opposite to me. I mean, this guy doesn't like using words of more than one syllable. You know, he really doesn't. Everything is very, very fundamental to him. But that's how I need it. That's how I need it because I can complicate anything. And, uh, you know, I, I went back on the road eventually and, um, you know, and I learned that wherever, really wherever rock and roll is served, Alcoholics Anonymous is there, you know, and, and I don't think I've been anywhere on tour, you know, in the 25 plus years that I've been sober, that there hasn't been an AA meeting. Um, I actually, I mean, it's interesting because I, like when, before, before I got sober, I'd go to a city like Tokyo you know, and I'd be like, and all, I, and I wanted to go to the clubs, you know, and I wanted to go to the clubs, and then I go, I go to the boutiques, I get to know, get to know the, get to get, get the vibe of the place, you know. Well, now I go to Tokyo, and, and all I want to do is go to some fucking midday meeting, you know, in some church in like the back of beyond, where there's like six people, you know, having a sixty-minute meeting, you know, a couple of them are like English teachers, and one blah blah. And that's, and I come out of that and I'm like, yeah, I'm set. I know this town. It's so weird how it works. You know, I love to share this particular anecdote because, you know, I am a touring musician. It's really what I do for a living. So for me, you know, a big part of my story is the fact that I get paid to travel the world and, 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 and appear on stages anywhere that will have me. And, um, you know, and I was touring through uh, Southern Asia um, and, uh, you know, and we're, playing Singapore, travel, Taiwan, travel, uh, Bangkok, you know, uh, and we get to Jakarta and it's a really intense schedule and there's no, there's no time to get to meetings. I get a, I get a day off in, in Jakarta and I'm like, I, if I don't get to a meeting today, I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to kill somebody in this band, you know, as somebody going down. Cause I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm so dry. And, um, and I think if my memory serves me i think we were still on like paper meeting you know i had this world directory that i would take with me and it was about that big world directory and i go like asia indonesia jakarta um fuck. you know the meeting's like in three is one meeting and it's in three days time but there was a phone number and i called the number and someone picked up and we start talking and this other person is a member of alcoholics anonymous and we start talking about being sober we talked you know sort of telling them how I'm feeling 15 minutes maximum 20 minutes and then I think it was a lady she says look I if you if you like I can come over to your hotel we can have coffee I said you know what I'm good thank you put the phone down I thought 
how, how does this work? I mean, in a city of 15 million, there's one other member of Alcoholics Anonymous in this city. And the fact that I now know that means I'm okay, that I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it through the day, through the night. Now that to me is a miracle. I can't, I can't draw any kind of parallel with that in civilian life. That is, that is extraordinary to me. Now, when I can acknowledge something like that, the power of that experience, acknowledging that, that's all the power that I need to believe that this shit is not only, it's gonna get me through the day, it's gonna get me through the night, you know, it's gonna, and it's gonna make me stronger and stronger and stronger. And then when I do have to take that leap, because we are all gonna have to take that leap, at some point, we're gonna have to go somewhere, a funeral, a wedding, a vacation, family vacation, we're gonna have to go somewhere where our sobriety is gonna be tested. We, we just, I mean, not only can we escape that, we don't want to escape that. We wanna live life on life's terms. I don't wanna be, I was in a prison. When I was, my, the last few years of my drinking, I was in jail. You know, I, I was terrified of the outside world. I don't wanna go back to that. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna eat the fucking world. I wanna go where I wanna go. I wanna go any, everywhere and anywhere, you know? I wanna go to the Appalachian Regional Roundup, I tell you, is where I wanna go. But, you know, I mean, I, I just wanna be able to go. I wanna be able to do, I don't want my alcoholism, which I do feel, you know, is it, you know, I'm living with a handicap of sorts. I do, I do believe that, you know? And it's, it, it's like, it's like diabetes. I mean, I just got a diabetes diagnosis about six months ago. And it's like, you know, and it, it requires a little bit of, uh, you know, re, like a reassessment, you know, and I have to, uh, it's taking me a while, you know, and there's anger and there's fear and there's sadness. You know, there's all those feelings are coming up because I'm having to make these changes, but, you know, but, you know, Xing drugs and alcohol and knowing, you know, wherever it is I'm going to go, I'm going to do it without, without drugs and alcohol. That's a big, that's a big thing. But I don't want to compromise, you know. I mean, whatever, however many years or months I've got left on this planet, you know, I don't want my choices to be determined by my alcoholism. You know, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be, you know, it's like, and you know, when I find myself doing that, if I'm dry, you know, if I've missed a couple of days of a meeting or, you know, I, I notice how my dryness starts determining, I start saying no, you know, and I start getting, no, I start getting a little mean and snide and cynical. And I don't want to see the grand grandchild because, you know, it just starts growing over me. You know, I need to be really, it's, I, it's like I always say, I want moist sobriety. I don't want to be dry, you know, dry, you know, you snap a dry twig. It's like, it's so easy. But a, but a moist, a moist twig, that's like, you really got to, you really got to pull at that thing, you know, and that's how I want to be. And the, and, the, and the way that I know how to be that is by doing this and showing up to these rooms, you know, day in, day out, three meetings a day, if that's what it's got to be, you know, I mean, online, man, I mean, hats off to all of us, right? How has AA handled the pandemic? Like, <sighs> I mean, better than any other agency I'm aware of. You know, if ever we needed like reinforcement that we know what we're doing, you know, because it's life or death for us, plain and simple, right? You know, it's like, uh, you know, they're closing down the meeting rooms. What do we do? I mean, we, get, we went online so fast, because, so fast, like our lives depended on it, you know? And, and now look at us, how, how, how extraordinary is it? I mean, for me, believe me, to have this experience of talking to you all tonight, it is, it is beyond my wildest dreams. It's, it's extraordinary and amazing. And I'm so grateful to you all for letting me have it. Um, but you know, meetings, IRL meeting, meetings are coming back. Bricks and mortar meetings are coming back. We can have it both ways now, you know, to the degree that you, the, the, that we choose. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, we, we started a, we started a meeting, uh, you know, more park, it's a 9am PST meeting, you know, and we went from like 25, 20, 25 people, five days a week, 
you know, at a room in Studio City to like 150, going up 175 people online every day of the week, you know. And we formed an offshoot men's meeting. And, and I mean, man, it's amazing, amazing, amazing. And, and you know, in those early days of the pandemic, when, when, it, when people were coming in, counting days, and those of us with time were thinking, oh, my God, they're never going to get, how are they going to stay sober without real meetings? And they did. They did. <laughs> you know, and now we're getting people that are celebrating, you know, like, yeah, yeah they're coming on two years. And some of them have hardly been to a, a real meeting, you know, and their sobriety is just as strong. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. And, you know, I hope if any, any of you, you know, I mean, you know, enthusiasm. I mean, I hope you picked up on my enthusiasm for the program. You know, you know, I don't consider this a prison, prison sentence. I, I, I love it. I love it. I get the connection with humanity that I always, always longed for, you know, and, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I find it's like, I mean, my relationship with you, with humanity is, is complicated. You know, I'm sure it is for all of us here. You know, it's like, we, we're so full of love, but we don't know, we so often don't know how to share it. You know, we're complicated people, you know, and, 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 and AA at least provides some degree of sim simplicity some way of just you know on a daily basis just like you know how to get along and live life on life terms and you know this is this is it you know we we had to go we had to get down so low you know to get the golden ticket and uh, i consider i had that and uh, thanks for letting me share tonight